Hi everybody, uh, this is Vince with Green Joe Coffee again. Yay, Green Green Joe, Green Joe Coffee Truck. Um, and today I'm going to be answering some questions from Molly. Uh, she sent me an email um, with about 10 questions. And, um, and I'd like to do this uh, every week and kind of make it a habit of mine to reach out to the audience. Um, a lot of questions obviously could be answered through the ebook, but um, sometimes there's some unanswered questions or some gray areas. And so, uh, one, this helps me provide a little bit of a better service to my folks buying the ebook, but it, it also helps with anybody that's out there, they're looking for some, some answers to coffee trucking. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started on the questions here. Uh, this is the first question is Do you have a separate fresh and gray water tank for your espresso machine? And sinks. Now, um, yes and no. Okay, so on the first Green Joe, I had bought one gray tank and one fresh tank, and my espresso machine and my uh, sinks are all attached together. They're in line. And when you buy an espresso machine, that's it's it's. I think that the name for that is an inline machine, where you can plug it in directly to your plumbing. Um, there's some pros and cons to that. Uh, one of the pros is once you set it, you can forget it, right? So once you put your espresso machine in, then you're done. It's now lined into your plumbing. It's hard lined in there, and that's it. You, know, you don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, but some of the negatives to that is, is also that your espresso machine is now, for lack of better words, permanently attached to the truck. Uh, I did that with my first truck. I have my Astoria Divina and the espresso machines permanently attached. But what I found is I do a lot of catering events, like a lot of indoor events, and with my espresso machine permanently attached to my truck, it made it real difficult for me to be able to get inside where the people are, like for example, a wedding. So I had to end up going and uh, I ended up buying a uh, second uh, machine, uh, espresso machine, specifically for indoor catering. Now, being mindful of that, and when I'm building my next truck, uh, what I would like to do is I'd like to build the truck in such a way that my espresso machine is able to be wheeled out of the truck for indoor catering events. And so on the second truck, I will have two different uh, water tanks. And uh, um, I'll have my fresh tank. And then what I'd like to do is just carry around five gallon tanks when I have to do uh, indoor catering. Um, so that provides me a little bit more flexibility and just having a little bit better advantage over my competition out there because uh, I'm not seeing any other coffee trucks do that. Uh, okay, so second question, is your generator noisy? Yes, it is. It's very noisy. Um, I think my city code requires less than 72 uh, decibels. Now, my generator, what I've done is I've built the sound box. And I'll be mindful if you if, if you look at the top you know, 10 mistakes I made during my uh, first truck. Um, what I did is I built this sound box around my generator and I melted my first generator. Um, there wasn't enough airflow and I thought it was sufficient, but when you're dealing with an 8,000 watt generator, the first hour that airflow is fine, but second hour, third hour, that thing gets hot and, uh, and, I, and I just nuked it. And so, um, just learning from my mistakes. Uh, the second one, I built a lot more airflow into it, and it quiets it to some extent. But you're still gonna deal with um, some noise. There's still it's not incredibly quiet. Now, one of the things that I'm considering for this. Uh, okay, so the the quietest generators out there are gonna be your Yamaha, and uh, there's also um, a Honda, of course, and I think Briggs. Uh, and Stratton just put out another generator that's um, considerably quiet. Uh, I think they get theirs down to like 52 decibel, which means you can have a conversation right next to it. Um, however, when you start looking at like a lot of wattage for those things, they can get pretty expensive. And right now, um, Costco has these generators. They're running, they're like 750 bucks. Um, they're 2,800 watts. And uh, it looks like you can take these two things and put them in line to each other, connect them together so that they generate a 220, a 50 amp circuit. And that's really interesting to me. So 
I'm looking into that and uh, seeing if I can pull that off for the next truck because that means that I'll spend about 1500 bucks, but I'll have just under 6,000 watts to play with at a very low noise level and they'll be portable and I can divide them into different events if I need to. So I like that idea because again, it just gives me more flexibility. I might be able to do an espresso catering gig here and then have someone else do a just a coffee gig over here. And because I have two generators, I can now split that up. So those are something to be mindful of. But the current one that I have is a Generac and it's, it's not quiet. Um, it's 8,000 watts running and I think 9,000 peak watts, and it's a, it's a pretty loud generator. So, and I have to tell people that before I set up, you know, I when I'm doing these phone consultations, I said, look, uh, my generator's not the quietest thing, so, you know, you're going to need to be mindful of that, you know, and, and, and they are, and that's fine. You know, you kind of expect that with food trucks. But um, Do you purchase your baked goods from Bakery Fresh or Prepackaged? I do a little bit of both. Um, so I have a local baker that brings by some baked goods. And then I just go to Costco and I uh, they sell muffins there. I wrap those and put them out there. And uh, so there's a little bit of variety there. Um, so yeah, so I do a little bit of both. I mean, if you can find a great deal with a local baker, awesome. Um, this particular baker, we weren't able to get, I was working on muffins and the muffins were pretty hard to stack up next to. They're kind of a little smaller. Um, she had a hard time getting the big muffins at a decent price. And so I just get those ones from Costco. But like all the other pastries, uh, we get from a local company. And if I ever need pastries on the way, I'll just run to Costco and pick them up. Uh, do you think it's wiser to buy an espresso machine new and pay monthly on it? Or purchase a old used machine with the possibility of complications, right? That's a really good question. Um, and I guess this kind of leads to your comfort level. I would look at, I know this sounds weird, but I would look at what kind of car do you drive? You know, if, uh, if you drive, you know, a newer model vehicle, uh, a Honda or something, I don't know, and you would rather have a new vehicle that works, but you pay a little bit more on it, then it might be better for you to do that uh, with your espresso machine. Now, if you're looking, I, I drive a uh, Toyota Tundra. That's what I drive. And if the thing breaks down, I'm, I, I'm willing to work on it. You know, I'm willing to kind of pop the hood up and take a look at it. And so it kind of depends on your comfort level. Um, you know, if you're interested. I find the espresso machine really interesting. So like the parts and the pressure and like the temperature, all that stuff is, um, it's pretty cool. I was a paramedic before this and it, it reminds me a lot of the human heart, um, high pressure, low pressure system with, uh, but anyhow, so, uh, so I like it. Um, but you may not. And so that's something to be mindful of. You don't want to deal with that headache. Go with a newer one. See if you can get something with a warranty. Um, I would strongly recommend when you're looking into espresso machines to talk to the guys at First Line. Uh, they're solid. They're just good people. They'll give you a solid recommendation. They are the expert on espresso machines. And so, um, you know, it's like Henry Ford says, you, 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 you stand on the shoulders of giants. And so that's one of the giants that I, that I stand on is, is First Line. They've been good to me so far. And I'll continue to make recommendations to them. So um, give those guys a call, and they'll, they'll help you really paint the picture on what espresso machine uh, to get. Um, okay, so it looks like you've got an EcoTemp water heater, and you're asking if I keep the propane outside. Um, and do I go under the truck with my piping or directly through the wall? So um, I go directly through the wall. I don't want to go under the... the um, carriage of the trailer because as you're driving rocks kick up and what that can do is that can cut your hose and so you'll want to protect that hose as much as possible in fact on my hose I have I wrapped it in a metal sheeting and then went through the wall um, so and and what that's going to do is it's going to save you a lot of headache when it comes time to get uh, propane inspected because some of these um, larger places will require a propane inspection and if your hose can be cut in any way you know, by rocks or anything else, then they're they're not they're going to deny you that. So you need to be mindful of that when you're when you're putting in your your propane. Um, my city code requires propane to be outside, so it, it, it by default it has to be. 
Um, back to the espresso machine. I need a water supply, correct, a power outlet, correct, and what else to get it fully functioning? I mean, other than the accessories, I assume, you know, we're, we're not talking about crafts and uh, thermostats for milk. Um, you will need a drain, right, because you're going to get gray water. That's the way the espresso machine will, will um, use this gray water or not uses gray water, but it creates gray water. So you'll need to have a drain to dump uh, your espresso machine. Um, you'll also need to do, to get familiar with back flushing. Um, the espresso machine builds up uh, a lot of uh, calcium and junk, all these electrolytes from the water. And so periodically what you have to do is you have to put this detergent through the espresso machine. It's not hard. It's, it's not hard. It's very easy to do. Um, but you just you do that to make sure that your piping doesn't clog, uh, basically. Um, that's going to be really important if you decide to go the used route on your espresso machine. So, um, and that's all I can think of for the espresso machine. Let's see. Oh, you asked, do you need to connect the water heater to the espresso machine as well? No, you don't. The espresso machine has its own water heater. Heater. It's called the boiler. And in fact, if you get an espresso machine that only has one tank, it most likely has something called a heat exchange, which is basically some copper piping that's within the boiler um, that allows your groove head to brew at a different temperature than your water steaming. Um, so real quick little thing on boilers and heat exchangers so you yeah, let me see where's my here we go okay so you have the the boiler and within the boiler there's this piping that uh, the water heats up and goes to the group head and that's where you brew espresso the boiler itself will, will be used for steaming milk remember um, to steam milk that temperature has to be above 200 uh, above boiling in order to generate steam but you can't brew espresso at, at that temperature um, so you have to have two different uh, temperatures, basically, uh, which means there needs to be some sort of cold water running through your espresso. So if you were to just put a uh, hot water heater and attach it to your espresso machine, it, you're not going to have good espresso because the temperature at your group head is going to be just way too high. Um, and you would just you would get bitter espresso all the time. So you do need cold water, especially on a... Uh, a uh, single boiler espresso machine. A dual boiler, that's an interesting question. I would leave that one up to first line and see what they think about it. Um, do you need to rinse out the milk pitcher every time you make new espresso drinks? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, and if you've ever seen those, they're called bartender rinsers. Those things are awesome because you just like put the steam pitcher on the um, bartender rinse and it just rinses it. It's pressurized, and so um, it's you can install it right next to your espresso machine. You just run some um, piping up from your fresh water to that, and it and it you need to attach it to your gray as well. Um, but those things are really cool, and they're really simple to use. So that's something to be mindful of. Um, does it make better foam if the pitchers introduce hot or cold? No, no foam is going to be basically. Um, air and that's where the art of um, espresso comes into. Um, so when you're steaming the milk, you kind of uh, you kind of cant the uh, the pitcher, and so you're coming in kind of at this like 45 degree angle, and what that does is it mixes the the air into the milk, and that's what creates your froth. So um, that foam or that froth is is basically generated from uh, the amount of air that you put into your, your milk when you're steaming it. Um, and the best thing I can advise for that is YouTube, YouTube, YouTube. Obviously, if you can get barista training, that's awesome. Um, but to be honest, I learned a lot of my uh, foaming um, from just gallons of milk, just over and over and over and over again. That's how you, you know. And, and on our truck, we, uh, we you know, I've gone to two barista trainings so far, and each one told me that you should be able to tell steam milk by the way it feels and by the way you you hear it. And I agree, you can. But in order to put, uh, it's so little to stick the temperature gauge in the milk. Like it's that's nothing. Like, and in my head, I go, why wouldn't you? You know. Uh, so we literally on every drink check the temperature of our milk 
Because in my opinion, um, it just takes once to screw that up to lose a customer. And the pros and cons aren't there. Like, I just think you're being lazy if you're not checking your temperature. It's like, oh, I'll just gauge it by feel. It's like, no, are you just going to like, you know, gauge your espresso shot by feel? I don't know, man. I just, uh, for me, in order to maintain quality, I think, I think you should, uh, check the temperature and we do on every truck. Everything's measured on the truck. I'm a big advocate of that. So, um, yeah, so, you know, and especially when you get really busy, that's how you're going to maintain quality. Uh, when you're making, you know, four or five drinks at once, um, you know, making sure that each milk that goes out is, uh, is at the right temp. Uh, it just, I think customers deserve that. So anyhow, that's my spiel on that. Yeah. I'll get off my soapbox now. Uh, are you consistent with your hours operational location or do you move around a lot? Um, I do both. So I have contracted a community college, but we do festivals, we do movie sets, I do weddings, I do corporate events. Um, I go to schools like the you know teacher appreciation days and that type of thing. I go to soccer, 5Ks, it doesn't matter. You know What I need to find is I look for um, population, how close I'm going to be to the event, and start times. It needs to be early. Um, I don't sell much coffee after 11 o'clock. Um, I need to be close to the event because if I'm across the street, that's not going to work for me. And, um, you know, uh, the competition is the other thing. I, you know, if they're selling coffee or giving away coffee or something like that, I, I just don't deal with that. So, um, so those are all things to be mindful of. Um, it kind of goes into your second question where um, we're talking about, like, one location or several locations to increase audience and market. And, and that's not a bad w way to go. And so I have one location Monday through Friday that I stay at and I'm stagnant. And it's nice because people know where to find me. I can build my audience and and they know where to, to, to find me. When you kind of move stagnant like that, you're like, well, where's this person going to be? And so at that point, you're going to have to be really good with communicating your location to your audience, you know, putting out weekly schedules and that type of thing. Um, the nice part about routes is if you if you plan a route well um, and your application is mobile, meaning it doesn't take you a lot to start the truck, your generators attach to the truck, these type of things, you can get coffee out pretty quick. I think there's a market for that. I mean, you can go to you know just say a you know a car lot where they're selling cars, and you you can probably sell you know fifteen drinks in in that hour, you know twenty drinks in that hour. And if you run the numbers on that, you know, four dollars a latte at twenty drinks is eighty bucks. I mean, if if you do eighty bucks an hour, uh, you know, what do you need four or five hours, and you're sitting close to three hundred bucks? I mean, that's great. Three hundred bucks a day times five days a week is is fifteen hundred bucks. Um, so I mean, that's six grand a month that you'll be making, and you know, minus your uh, margins, but I mean, you can, you know, for part-time work, that's not bad at all. So, um, so there's pros and cons to both. And I think you just kind of look at your environment. You know, I don't know your city, uh, I know you're out in San Francisco, but I don't know it well as far as like where to park and, and what that would take. But you want to look at, if anything, start times and competition, those are going to be key. And if you can find a place with good foot traffic, the better. Otherwise, consider doing like a drive through operation, you know, um, depending on city permitting, of course. All right, let me, let's see here. How long did you take, how long did it take for you to see a profit? Um, well, it took me three months to pay off the investment. And then um, anything after that was, was profits. I mean, we've, we've done great. Um, so I'm, I'm blessed. I, I really am. We, we got a, a great community. We've been able to get in some awesome events. Um, we've done, you know, the Gildan Bowl. We've done the Rolling Stones concert. Um, we've done so many movie sets. You know, we've met Skylar Astin, the guy from Pitch Perfect. We met uh, Jamie Sigler, the gal from uh, The Sopranos. Um, it's, it's just been wonderful. It's just been awesome. And, you know, we've made good money doing it um, so much that I, I have to buy a second truck now. You know, now I'm like, I'm overbooked, um, which is great. You know, it's a good problem to have. So, um, it you know, 
a lot of it is kind of taking a look around at um, what what the environment could be. Um, you know, there's, and I'm going to kind of give a, a, a real basic breakdown, but this is kind of in my mind how I see it. Uh, if anyone's gone um, deep sea fishing, uh, it's kind of a tangent, but work with me here. If anyone's gone deep sea fishing, you know that what you do is you, you cast net or you cast chum. And really what you're trying to do is you're, you're, you're trying to attract a wide audience, right? Now, if you've gone fly fishing, you're really, you're, you're, you're you know, you got one fly and you're trying to get one fish. And so that's kind of the difference between the two. And what I really want to do is I'm trying to create a hybrid. Um, and I found that to be a really good business model. So Green Joe, the first one, uh, the first uh, trailer, is really made for the masses. So it's kind of that deep sea fishing thing. Um, and I can handle large audiences, right, which is great. Big, big events, big festivals. Um, but the second one, and what I found to also be really profitable, is catering. And that's kind of the fly fishing thing, right? I get, I get one fish. Like, I do, you know, I, I deal with one person. You know, if it's an, a, an event planner for a wedding... They pay me for the, the the entire wedding, and I don't do any transactions, and that's kind of cool too, you know. So I really want to build a truck in which I catch both of those business models. Um, that way, I have a lot of versatility, and I can I can adapt to whatever environment I need to. Versus, you know, if I'm just catering for the masses, you're you're going to miss out on a lot of those wedding events. And I think what what you'll come to find is once you become the coffee guy or gal. Um, you know, people just think of you as that. They don't think of you as like, uh, you know, whether or not this truck is going to work for their event. So I want to create a business that will be able to work for multiple events. And that way I just kind of have an edge over my, my, uh, my competition. All right. I think we're 22 minutes into this video. So I need to, I need to stop rolling this one. Um, so my name is Vincent. Uh, the company I own is Green Joe Coffee Truck. Um, we sell an ebook online that uh, it just it covers so much. I, we put so much into that ebook, and we're still updating it. So, um, you know, if you're really interested in this, just get the ebook. It really helps save a lot of, of research. Um, if you have any questions, you can email me greenjoecoffee at gmail.com. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. We send these out once a week. Subscribe if you want to get if you want to get more of them. Um, tag friends that helps with the video um, be more popular you know so comment that type of thing really helps um, so that other coffee truck uh, future coffee truck owners will see this and, and hopefully they can use it and, and uh, uh, so anyhow well thank you so much for watching and you guys have a great day